which comes from the gospel according to John chapter 11. And we're going to read verses 17 to 37. We're going to have an alternate reading, which means that um, I'll read the first verse and we'll all respond together with the verse after that. We'll keep going back and forth until the end. So please stand as able once you've found the scripture. And again, that's John chapter 11, verses 17 to 37. Again, it's John 11, 17 to 37. May the Lord bless the reading of God's word. Oh, and, and I did want to say, uh, we're going to uh, go back and get some of the context for the story, uh, what's before and after it. So you probably want to keep your Bibles open uh, even after we read. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. We are continuing our sermon series called Encountering Jesus, and it's based on the book by Tim Keller called Encounters with Jesus. And so we've been going through many stories in the Bible about Jesus encountering people to see what it tells us about the person of Jesus. And today we are going to deal with perhaps the most attribute of Je uh, the, the most important attribute of Jesus, um, but it's probably one of the most difficult to understand attributes of Jesus. And is it, it is the idea that Jesus is not just a man, but he is 100% man and 100% God at the same time. Not 50% man, 50% God, 80% man, 20% God, or vice versa, but fully God, fully man, all residing in the same person. It's pretty mind-blowing, isn't it, to think that? You know, what does that mean? You know, we have this kind of trippy cosmic Jesus picture <laughs> up behind us, right? Like, like, how do you wrap your heads around that? You know, the idea of the infinite God, uh, God who is above all. And maybe you think of God in that way. God is this force that isn't necessarily very personal or warm. God is just big and powerful and just out there, aloof, somewhere in the universe, cosmic, and, and vast, and to think that all of that could come and reside in a human being and be both man and God at the same time. What do you do with that, friends? It's mind-blowing. And so we're going to try to understand this, and we're going to uh, look at this story, uh, which is about really two sisters and them grieving the loss of their brother. And this family, uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, they were very near and dear to Jesus' heart. And so uh, before this, we didn't get the context, but um, a few verses before, we see that Mary and uh, Martha send word to Jesus 
that Lazarus is going to die. He's sick. He's on his, you know, last few breaths. And they're like, Jesus, the one that you love, Lazarus, he, he's going to kick the bucket. You know, it's coming any day now. And, and what's kind of cool about that is they don't even need to ask Jesus. They don't have to be like, Jesus, we humbly request your presence to be here for Lazarus. You know, please come. They don't have to beseech him. They, all they have to say is, Lazarus is sick, and he's the one you love, right? I mean, that's how close they were, you know? And just like, like anyone that, you know, you're close to, that, that you love, if you hear about them being in trouble, you just come running, right? But a kind of a strange thing happens is Jesus does not come right away. He waits for two days. We're not really sure why. I mean, you know, you could look at that and be like, Jesus, why would you do that? You know, but there is something about Jesus' timing, that Jesus knows what the perfect timing is. And what we find out is that um, he waits for two days, and by the time he gets there, um, Lazarus has already been dead for four days, right? And so Lazarus might have died while this message was being transported, or the amount of time that it took for Jesus and his disciples to get there took way longer than that two days. So Jesus knew that it wouldn't have mattered. But the whole idea of Lazarus being dead for four days tells us something very important. Well, it tells us that Lazarus is dead. Not dead like, like yeah, he's dead. He's dead dead, right? Like stinking dead. He's starting to decompose, right? And so um, there, there are some stories of Jesus raising people from the dead, you know? And there's a story of him raising a woman from the dead. And she, as far as we know, had just died. And maybe you could say, oh, you know, she wasn't like fully dead. She was just like in a coma or she was just unconscious. But when you've been dead for four days, that's a different story, right? So like if someone just died that day, you know, you could almost be like, okay, so that's a miracle. That's pretty cool. But it's almost like just putting like the breath of life back into them. You know, their heart just stopped beating and, and Jesus just had started again. You know, it's almost like getting those shockers and clear, you know, and Jesus could do that somehow, you know? But how do you raise a person from the dead who's decomposing, who's been dead for four days? What does that look like? This is a greater miracle. This is an amazing thing that we're going to see. And Jesus tells us that this had to happen so you would see the glory of God. And we're going to talk about what exactly that is. But here we see it picking up where we uh, started the story. Martha goes uh, to the edge of town to meet Jesus. And uh, so, you know, basically, she's the, the welcoming party. Mary stays behind for some reason. Maybe she's still mourning. Maybe she has to collect herself before she can um, meet Jesus herself. Uh, but Martha goes out first, and she says this to Jesus. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. There's a lot there, and we don't know exactly what Martha meant. Is this a little subtle dig at Jesus, saying like, Jesus, what took you so long? If he had been here, he wouldn't have died. If he had just hurried a little bit. It just seems like you took your sweet old time. I don't know. But you still see here is a statement of faith. If you had been here, he wouldn't have died. I believe that, right? Even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And this is how Jesus responds. He responds with truth. He says, your brother will rise again. And Martha responds with something that maybe a lot of us would say, but coming from Martha, it's more extraordinary. And I will explain why. Martha answers, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. That's something we kind of take for granted. We're like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, there's going to be this judgment thing. And then, you know, Jesus is going to come. And then, you know, all of us will be raised. Yeah, you know, I believe that. But for Martha to say that was a statement of bold faith because traditionally Jewish people the Israelite religion did not recognize resurrection. They didn't really know what happened when you died. You went to this place called Sheol, where your, your soul would just kind of linger there, you know? And it wasn't really a place of reward. It wasn't really a place of punishment. You were just there with dead people, you know? And, and people didn't really know what to make of this resurrection thing. The Pharisees started teaching resurrection, but there's still a lot of people that were kind of iffy on it. So for Martha to even say this shows her faith. But Jesus comes back, and he says something even bolder. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. 
The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing me will never die. Do you believe this? Notice that he doesn't say, I can resurrect. I can give life. Like I'm a, a, an anointed prophet who can give life. He says, I am life itself. What is Jesus saying here, friends? He's claiming to be divine, right? He's not just claiming to be someone blessed by God. He's claiming to be God because only God can give life. Only God can give life again. And he says, even now, I can bring that life if you believe. Do you believe this? And Martha responds with great faith. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who's to come into the world. So here we see a bold proclamation of Jesus' identity. A few weeks back in a large group for uh, the college and postgrad group, uh, we went through the whole uh, idea of Jesus' identity as the Son of God. And some people say, Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God, but passages like this beg to differ. Jesus did claim to be divine. And it, throughout the scripture, I mean, there's so many stories, and, and we went through it uh, in our large group. And, you know, email me or hit me up sometime if you want to see what those passages are. We'll show them to you. They're all over the place. Jesus' claims, which are subtle, like in this case, are sometimes outright. He is saying, I'm not just a normal man. I'm not just an anointed prophet. I'm not just a good teacher. I am the son of God. I am God. It's a bold claim, right? Um, and so we see this from Martha, and we're, we're going to take this aside for a second, and now we're going to shift to the other sister, Mary. And what we're going to see is Mary goes to the exact same place and says the exact same thing to Jesus. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Same thing, exactly same statement. But Jesus doesn't say, I am the resurrection and the life. What does he do? He saw her weeping, and he saw the other people mourning, and he started feeling something in his heart. He was deeply moved in spirit, the scripture says, and he was troubled. And he says, where have you laid him? Come and see, they replied. And then Jesus wept. Friends, um, you know, th this is the shortest verse in the Bible, right? Um, th this is the verse that, uh, you know, Sunday school kids um, just for ages have been so thankful that this verse exists for whenever their teacher's like, hey, you need to me memorize a verse in the Bible. They're like, oh, okay, John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept, right? It's so easy, you know? Why was, is this just these two words? Why is it Jesus wept? This is extraordinary, friends. Okay, now picture for me uh, for a second that you were writing a story and your main character was somebody who had like divine powers. You know, this person could bring people back from the dead, okay? And so imagine that he's gonna go and he's gonna raise his friend from the dead. So as he strolls into town, what do you, how do you describe this person's demeanor and their attitude? Wouldn't you describe them as being like really loose and confident? You know, maybe even smiling, you know, maybe like, like under their breath, they're like, hey, you know, all right, come on, let's do this, you know? And, and kind of like, like kind of rubbing their hands in anticipation, like, man, th these people are, they're going to be amazed, you know? Because this person has the powers of God. They can do anything, right? Or you might just keep the person kind of aloof. I am the resurrection and the life, everyone, you know? but you probably wouldn't describe this person as weeping, as crying, as being upset and disturbed and heartbroken, right? It doesn't really make sense because this person is going to resurrect this person just in a few moments. So why the tears? Why is Jesus so upset? Friends, what we hear, what we see here in full effect is we see the humanity of Jesus. And this would have been extraordinary for people. It's the reason why whoever demarcated the verses, right, because it, it didn't come out like this. Somebody had to decide what verses were going to be what. And they decided, you know what, 
this little piece here, these two little words, Jesus wept, need to be kept by themselves because this is extraordinary. It's mind-blowing. Friends, um, you know, you think about uh, the, the Jewish people and their view of God or pretty much any religion's view of God. God being powerful and cosmic, all-knowing, all good, a force above all forces, right? That um, the Jewish people, they wouldn't even pronounce the name of God. If it was written down, you wouldn't say God's name. That's how much they respected God. That's how high they thought of God. And to think of a God who weeps, it just would, would have blown their minds. But here you see Jesus. He's broken up because he sees his dear friend Mary, and she is just beside herself in tears. And he goes to the tomb where his friend lies, and he starts to weep. Friends, what does his weeping look like, by the way? Um, you know, when, when you think about somebody weeping, um, you know, maybe you think of, like, Jesus, like, this is the way I, I picture the story, by the way. Like, Jesus wept. I, I pictured it like this. Jesus just goes, like, and then, like, one little tear, like, ding, you know, that's it. Okay, now, Lazarus, come out, right? Like, like and then back to power, back to glory. That's what I picture. But friends, um, we, we have a picture here, which I think was, like, from a movie or something. You know, is that the way you picture Jesus weeping? Like, being beside himself, being so overcome with emotion that he's, like, shaking, that he's moaning, that he's groaning, that he's crying out and screaming, no, no, no. Is that what you picture? <laughs> thank you, thank you, my Oscar, please. Um, friends, seriously though, l l let's think about this for a second. Is that what you picture of Jesus? You know, for most of us, we're still kind of like on this whole God thing, son of God thing. We think of Jesus as being so confident, so put together. We don't see that. But the scripture begs to differ. Um, if we go back for a second and we look at where right before he cries, um, it says that he saw Mary, who he loved, weeping. He saw the other people weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And then in the next verse, it's gonna say, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. That, that word there is so badly translated you know, it, it's, it's, it's amazingly badly translated. Um, it, it's a really hard word to translate into English from the Greek. But that word there, because there's other words for deeply moved that, that are used all the time through scripture. This is not the word. This word actually denotes anger. It denotes a, a physical response, a groan that comes out from Jesus. Jesus is ticked off. He's mad. He's raging. He's shaking. Friends, what? Why would he be doing that? Is that weird? You know, so a lot of people, they don't know what to do with that. You know, like, like you look at that in the Greek, and people, like, like they see this word, and it actually occurs throughout the Bible when, when, you know, people are being rebuked. Sometimes they use this exact same word because they're like, oh, yeah, anger, right? But here, like, people didn't know what to do with it. So they're like, oh, uh, deeply moved. no. Jesus is mad. Who's he mad at? Is he mad at the people? Well, he's looking at Mary, who's heartbroken, who he loves, right? He's not mad at her, right? Is he mad at, like, the people mourning? Friends, I don't think so. That doesn't make sense. But what is he mad at? Friends, I think Jesus is mad at death. Jesus is looking at this. He's looking at this problem of sin and evil and suffering. And Jesus is looking at this and he's like, it's messed up. Don't you ever get like that sometimes? You look at the stuff in this world, you get so mad. You know, I, I think about this whole like human trafficking thing. And friends, I, I tell you like when I really think about it and I really think about what's going on, I think about like kids who are, about the same age as my daughter, being forced to have sex with strangers? How can you not get mad? How can you not get angry? And Jesus looks at the suffering in this world. He looks at his friend dying. 
even though he knows he can reverse it. And Jesus, like many of us, says, it's not right. Even though Jesus is God, he fully feels the weight. He fully feels how heavy sin and death is. And Jesus is not okay with it. Some of us might wonder, well, if Jesus is that mad, if God is that not okay with sin and death and suffering, then why doesn't he just snap his fingers and get rid of all of it? We, we actually talked about this at our um, large group this past week uh, for the college and postgrad uh, about suffering. And, you know, if Jesus were to just get rid of all the, the, the sin and evil in this world, well, there's a huge problem with that because a lot of the sin and evil is deeply entrenched in us. If we were to snap his fingers and say, no more sin and evil, well, pretty much all of us would die, right? We'd all be destroyed. And so God is very clear. I have come to save the lost, not to destroy them, not to get rid of them, right? But he also is going to do something about the cost, about the destruction and the devastation. And here's Jesus raging at sin and death and evil and suffering, crying tears, shaking with anger, groaning in his spirit and groaning outwardly and then saying to the dead man, Lazarus, come out from here. Take away the stone. So right before this happens, right before Jesus summons Lazarus out, you know, we're told, again, Jesus once more deeply moved, right? We know that's not the word. He, Jesus once more angry, groaning with, with, with this disturbed spirit. He tells him to take away the stone, and Martha's like, Jesus, I don't think you want to do that. I mean, maybe you want to see him, but it, it's not a pretty sight. It's going to be nasty and smelly. And Jesus says, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. And then he, he, they take away the stone and he says, Lazarus, come out. And, and Lazarus comes out. And that's the glory of God, right? That's what most of us think. You know, the glory of God is that Jesus was able to raise a man from the dead. But going back to this whole idea of Jesus being angry and just really disturbed and shaking, friends, there's more that's going on here. So um, pretty much every reference uh, of Jesus talking about his glory has to do with one singular thing. It usually has to do with his death. When he says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, we come to understand that means he's talking about dying. He's talking about going to the cross and being nailed there. In fact, right after this, um, people report back to the religious leaders and they hear about this and it's from this event that they decide to kill Jesus, right? So in other words, Jesus knows in order to bring Lazarus out of the tomb, I need to go into the tomb. This is what it cost for Jesus to defeat the forces of evil and sin in this world. This is what it cost for Jesus to reverse death itself. So Jesus knows all this, and he says, Lazarus, come out. Friends, so here we see a, a picture on one hand with Jesus and Martha, in both cases with Martha, right? Both stories we get with Martha, Jesus is telling her, I'm the resurrection and the life, and then in the next story, he's showing her that he's the resurrection and the life that this is my glory, that I'm gonna die so that all of you can be raised, right? We see his power, we see his majesty, we see that Jesus is God. And then with Mary, we see that this is a, a God who's not aloof, but a God who loves us and cares about us, who is tender, who is gracious, who is merciful. And friends, we get this idea that he's not just a God, but he's with us. Friends, it's not enough to just have a God, you know, but we need comfort, you know, and, and it makes me think of, um, you know, pretty much like any of us, like when we're going through hard times, you know, maybe some of us want truth. We need truth at times, you know, and, and have you ever been really upset about something, just really disappointed, really shattered, right? And then you have 
like a friend that comes up to you and tries to rationalize it with you. Hey, you know what? Of course you didn't get that job because, you know, only like 2% of the applicants got the job. So, hey, you know, you, you were in the 98%. Don't, don't be so sad. Statistically, the odds were stacked against you. What, what do we usually do with friends like that? <laughs> what, what do we usually respond to those friends? Are we like, oh, thank you for hitting me with the truth, right? I really appreciate it. No, we're like, dude, I'm not telling you this so that you can hit me with the truth. I just want you to be here with me. I just want you to cry with me. I just want you to be disappointed with me. And I've learned this lesson all the well um, from my experiences of being with people in the hospital. Um, I, I've always been afraid of visiting people in the hospital. And, you know, for uh, five years before th this newest cycle of being a pastor, now I'm just at LGM, but I was at two churches before. I was at LGM in, in a much older church called St. Matthew's. And um, so there was a lot of people, probably average age, like mid-70s. So I had a lot of hospital visits. I did a lot of funerals. And every single time I either did a hospital visit or a funeral, um, you know, it, it was always a really, like, you know, emotional thing. You know, always very heartbreaking. But in the beginning, I used to be scared because I thought, like, what am I supposed to say? What do you say to someone who is sitting by their loved one, their husband, or their, their mother or their father, and they're crying. Well, what kind of truth can I give them? What kind of advice can I give them? You know, what do I say to someone who just lost their kid? You know, um, who, who somebody, um, this actually happened, uh, one of the people, uh, th their son had an epileptic seizure in his basement, and um, he fell on, uh, it, because of the seizure, and he cracked his head open, just on the concrete. There's no warning. You know, and by the time they found him, uh, he had bled so much, his brain had hemorrhaged so much that he had permanent brain damage. And they had to make the difficult decision to unplug him. What do you say to people like that? And you know what I learned after doing this for five years? What I learned in most cases is that people, they don't expect you to give them the answers. They don't expect you to hit them with the truth right then and there. What they want is someone to hold their hand. What they want is someone to be there with them. What they want is someone to just be present. And sometimes you don't have to say anything at all. You just have to be there. You just have to put an arm around them. You just have to look them in the eye and be there. Not be somewhere else like, oh my gosh, this is weird. Oh my gosh, what do I do? Just be there. You know, and in many ways, if somebody just hits us with the truth, it may be true, but you may want nothing to do with that person. You know, and for a lot of us, the idea of God may be like very interesting. It may be very cool to think like there's this cosmic being that created everything. But where does that hit you in your heart? Where does that hit you in your life? You don't just need a God that created everything and is powerful. You need a God that is with you. You need a God that cares about you. And this concept of God being, uh, Jesus being fully God and fully man may be a little mysterious. But friends, this is what we most need, you know? And so if we can get over our intellectual hesitations and just look at the beauty of who Jesus is and say, God, this is what I need. I need a God man. I need someone who is both. Because here we see, um, some of you may have been wondering, why did we end uh, the scripture reading with verse 37? Because verse 37, we hear... hear um, the people say after Jesus is weeping, and they're like, oh my gosh, look at Jesus. Look at how he loved his friend Lazarus. And they said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? So in other words, they're asking a question that maybe some of us have. Yes, it's one thing to be there for someone, right? To be there in, in the midst of their suffering, to really care about them. But at the end of the day, they're like, okay, so it's really cool that he's here. It's really cool that he's crying and he's sympathizing. Lazarus is still dead. There's still the suffering. And Jesus, why couldn't he stop it? And friends, we don't just have a man who cares about us, who's with us. We have a God who can do something about it. Remember what Jesus says to Martha and Mary. He is the resurrection and the life. So, friends, um, th there's this song uh, called, uh, like a, I think it's called Like a Lion by David Crowder, right? And it's like, um, let love explode and bring the dead to life. 
my heart is cold, I need a resurrection somehow. Uh, in this song, there's that line, I need a resurrection somehow. And this is the question that I want to leave you with. Do you need a resurrection? Because at the end of the day, you may, you know, have somebody whose shoulder you can cry on, you know? And that, that's actually pretty cool, like to have a friend who really cares about you. It helps. It helps tremendously. But friends, why do we need Jesus then? We already have loved ones. We already have friends. You know, some of us uh, have boyfriends, girlfriends. We have um, moms and dads. We have, you know, best buddies. We have, you know, people all around you who could do this, who could sympathize with you, who could be there with you. Why do we need God? Because at the end of the day, after you cry on their shoulders, after they look at you sympathetically and they say, oh, I'm so sorry, after they give you a hug and they hold you and you cry your eyes out, you still have your problem. You still have death. And friends, when we talk about needing a resurrection, it's not just talking about physical death. And Jesus is very clear about that. You know, like Martha wanted to make this all about like, you know, dying and death and then heaven and eternal life. He's like, oh yeah, I believe that you can raise me on the last day. And Jesus says, okay, how about now? I'm the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, I can bring new life right now. Friends, do you believe that? Do you need that? You know, I've been sharing um, from my personal life times where I've experienced spiritual deadness. You know, I I've struggled for years with depression. I've struggled with alcohol abuse. I've struggled with a lot of these things. And friends, I don't know what your struggle is. I don't know where your spiritual deadness comes from. Maybe it comes from pride. Maybe it comes from some sexual sin. Maybe it comes from your sense of hopelessness. You look at the prospects of your life and you look at everyone else passing you up and you just wonder, when is my time gonna come? How can I possibly measure up? You look at the disappointment of your parents and you think, I just can't measure up to their expectations. I can't do it. I try and I keep failing. Maybe you look at your own brokenness in your life that you don't even know why you feel so lonely, but you do. You don't know why you feel so disturbed, but you are. And at the end of the day, you're like, okay, that's great. That's great that people care about me. That's great that people, that, that they sympathize. But I need something more. I need newness of life. And friends, this is the good news of this story. Think about this. If Jesus can raise a man who's been rotting in a tomb for four days, if he can raise him to life, what can't he raise? What in your life needs new life? What in your life right now needs resurrection? Because here is Jesus saying, I want to give it to you. And for me in my life, what I've experienced is not that all my problems go away. I haven't experienced like, like this healing like, like, oh my gosh, you know, now I just have no sinful desires anymore. But what I've experienced is change. What, have I, what I've experienced is a turning of a page, the turning of a corner, looking upon God and his compassion and his love for me and knowing that I have hope. You know, and friends, this is what I want to leave you with. And this is what I want you to think about. What hope does Jesus bring to you? And where do you need that? If you don't feel that, maybe you can ask God yourself. God, I want to have an encounter with this Jesus. Because I believe you can have that. I need a resurrection somehow. And friends, have you cried out to Jesus? Have you invited him? like Mary and Martha? Have you come to his feet and said, Jesus, if you are here, I know there is nothing impossible for you. Because friends, you know, you might be hearing this message and you're like, okay, Steve, but I haven't seen it before. You know, I haven't gotten the resurrection. But then my question is, have you asked? Have you come weeping at his feet, being broken and not saying, oh God, I got this, okay? I can fix my life by myself. Jesus, you don't have to come. You just stay there. I'm gonna resurrect this. But when you got Martha and Mary just coming before Jesus and saying, Lord, our brother's dead, dead, dead. Only you can bring that life. You come weeping, you come broken, you come with no 
other pretense, but saying, Jesus, I absolutely need your resurrection. I'm going to invite the uh, praise team to come up, and we're going to sing a song called With Us. But I want to invite you, friends, uh, to pray with us. And so why don't we just take a moment to reflect upon some of the areas of spiritual deadness in your life. Maybe we can reflect on the things that make you rage and make you angry. The areas where you feel hopeless. And let's just take a moment and um, come before God. God has come for the brokenhearted, not for the haughty or the proud. But many of us, we have this pride. We have this sense that, Jesus, I got this. I can clean up the mess in my life. Not so with Mary and Martha. They had no pretense. They knew they could not fix that mess. So friends, why don't we come before God with that same spirit, that same brokenness? Lift up your spiritual deadness and just cry out to this God who cries out with you who cries with you, who enters into your pain and says, I know what it's like to lose friends. I know what it's like to be rejected. I know what it's like to face the worst that this world has to offer. I know what it's like to feel the most intense pain and rejection, to feel utterly alone and despair. And I have come so that you don't have to feel that anymore. I have come to bring resurrection somehow. Precious God, may you be with us, Lord. We cannot do it on our own. We cannot raise ourselves. Lord, we are powerless and we are weak. But Lord, you are the God who is all powerful, all loving. You've come to be with us to enter into the very midst, the very center of our brokenness. What can we say, Lord? But praise you, we honor you, we glorify you, and it is your glory that you went to the cross and you overcame us on our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen.